Greetings, brethren, from Mr. Armstrong first and foremost, and then from those of us in Pasadena. We no longer call it headquarters. Headquarters is in Tucson, Arizona, where Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong lives. My wife, who's here with me, and I have been looking forward to being back in Lake of the Ozarks. We lived here about, I guess it was just eight months, uh, in late 77 to early 78, and uh, I always look forward to coming back. I don't know that my wife has the same anticipation because she never got accustomed to uh, accepting the ticks and the wasps and the other creatures here that, that seem to inhabit this delightful little area of the world. I grew up with them at least much of my life, picking off ticks and that type of thing, so uh, I don't relish the idea, but I can live with it if I have to. This morning, I guess it was Mr. Um, Cassie that was talking about some of the jokes relative to marriage. And in fact, I've got a, a book, 2,000 Insults, and there are quite a few in there about um, husbands and wives and what have you. But one I remember that seems to point up, unfortunately, what often happens in marriage. They say, marriage is just like a three-ring circus. Some of you may have heard it, but anyway, they say, first there's the engagement ring, and then there's the wedding ring, and then there's the supper ring. And that's the one that people seem to wear the longest in so many marriages. <clears throat> Maybe tomorrow, um, I believe Mr. Cassie will be letting me take the announcements and I could mention just a little bit about Ambassador College. Uh, I don't want to take the time to do that today and I'll try not to take too much time from the sermon tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. But I would like to tell you a little bit later just about Ambassador College. Everything seems to be coming along very well with the college, and uh, we ask your continued prayers for the college. Well, brethren, I'm sure a number of you saw the Democratic and Republican conventions that were held fairly recently. I wonder how many of you might have heard some of the closing remarks they were made by Senator Barry Goldwater, in which he, after he had um, made the remarks in his type script, he departed from the text and he ad-libbed some words, and he said that there were powerful forces both within this nation and without the nation that were seeking to destroy America. And he mentioned, and I'll give his exact words, he mentioned... He said, quote, this might be the last Republican convention and in two weeks the last Democrat one. Now, what did he mean by that statement? Well, I think, you know, Mr. Armstrong has written fairly recently saying that time may be closing in on us. The storm clouds are gathering as they were before World War I and especially before World War II. Commenting on Senator Barry Goldwater's statement, I think it was the following day, anyway, on August the 5th, I guess it was, this very year, the Pasadena Star News had this statement. It said, could this be our last election? Barry Goldwater sounded the ominous note at the convention inferring that four more years of Carter could bring the destruction of America. But it doesn't matter who is president of the United States. It doesn't matter that much because God shows that oftentimes the people who are in high positions in this world's government, in this world's politics, that the people who sit in the high positions of governmental authority are not saints. They may profess to be born again, but they're not saints. They don't know God. They don't fear God. They're more concerned about power. They don't any w way whatsoever begin to comprehend God's way. And so again, Senator Barry Goldwater seemed to imply that he thought the United Nations or the United States might not exist as a viable nation four years from now. Now the fact is, brethren, we don't know whether we have six months, a year and a half, three years, or what, until 
the storm clouds burst forth on this nation, and not only on this nation, but on the whole world. And even though this is a joyful feast, and we're told to rejoice before God for seven days, I want us to take a little time this afternoon, let's see, I have nearly a quarter past the hour, I want us to take a little time this afternoon to seriously reflect on the meaning of world conditions, and I want to see how many of you are obeying the command, a simple command of Jesus Christ that I'm going to read, and then I'm going to try to leave one thought, just one thought with you this afternoon from the sermon. If you forget everything else, just remember one thought. Turn with me, first of all, to Luke chapter 21. And Christ had been talking about the Great Tribulation. Now, maybe I can go back and comment on that a little bit later. But in Luke 21, after talking about the Great Tribulation and the heavenly signs of Christ's coming and finally the glorious appearing of the Messiah to rule over this earth, Jesus Christ says in verse 36 of Luke 21, Watch ye therefore... And pray always. And he, st- he then said they were his disciples, his followers, the Christians, were to pray for two things. But he says, pray always, or as the Moffat has it, pray day by day for these two things. Now, what two things did he tell us to pray for always, or day by day? He said, watch you therefore and pray always. Number one, he says that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And he had previously described the horrible events culminating in World War III or the Great Tribulation. He said to pray, firstly, that they would be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And secondly, he said to pray that the Christians would be accounted worthy or, let's say, would be able to stand before the Son of Man, that is, to be accounted worthy to stand blameless, without spot or without blemish, before Jesus Christ at his second coming. Now, there, are, there is a command to pray always, every single day, for two things. One, that we might escape the tribulation, and two, that we might be found without spot or blemish, or, let's say, worthy or acceptable to Christ, that we would stand before him. Not be ashamed at his coming and fall, as it were, before him, but stand before him. I would like to ask you at the outset of this sermon, how many of you think you can honestly say that you carry out Christ's command, that you obey this command? Let's say even three-fourths of the time, three out of four days, out of the, out of the let's say, um, out of a four-day period, how many of you think you even that you remember to pray, as Christ said, that you might escape, and secondarily that you would be blameless, that you would be able to be accounted worthy in his sight to stand before him at his second coming? Could I see the hands of those that believe you, you even pray three out of four days, pray for those two things? Could I see the hands? I'm just curious. And be honest, I'm just curious. Most of you I know don't, so you... you, you if, If you don't raise your hand, you don't need to feel too embarrassed. You've got a lot of company. Well, how many of you feel you even pray half the time, one day out of uh, of two, that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man? How many of you think you even pray half the time? Well, again, could I see your hands? It looks to me like maybe one out of uh, 50, maybe one out of 75, maybe one out of 100. So what I want to do this afternoon is to impress upon you this command of Jesus Christ, that he said we were to watch and pray always that we might be accounted worthy to escape these things, and secondarily, that we would stand before the Son of Man at his coming. Let's ask a few questions, though. Will there be an escape before the tribulation, that is, will we, the church, escape before the great tribulation springs upon this world? Is there a way of escape? 
Why would God make a way to, of escape? Or to put it differently, why would God not make a way of escape? If you knew what God shows is going to happen on this earth, you would want to escape it. You would certainly want to escape it. Because it isn't going to be pleasant. As World War II was infinitely more horrible than World War I, with more suffering, more destruction, more deaths. Fifty-five million people perished in World War II. About ten million, I guess it was, perished in the concentration camps. Around six million, uh, six million perished in, in Auschwitz in Austria. Many of them perished as a little puff of smoke up the chimney of the incinerators, where they, they were burned and their, their bodies were used as ashes to fertilize the crops. Some of them had their very skins torn off and they were used as lampshades. And a lot of other things. Their hair was used in mattresses. You younger people probably haven't heard much or read much about the concentration camps, the death camps, or the extermination camps, as they were called, that the Nazis built in World War II, and the Japanese committed almost as many atrocities. And yet, World War II, with all its horrors, according to the Bible, is going to be like, or let's say, was like a picnic in comparison to what God says is going to come to pass on this earth in what we call World War III. God says all the earth will be affected in a very horrible way, as I will show you in a moment. Does God's word say where his church will go, where will it flee, to, where, to what place will it escape? Does God say who will be protected during this time? And let's ask another question, which some of our enemies, some of the former ministers who, who departed from God's way, have thrown up at us. Are we, the worldwide church of God, are we preaching a fear religion because we teach that God's church will be taken to a place of safety before the Great Tribulation? Are we, in fact, teaching a fear religion? Because we teach that the church will flee before the tribulation. And another question which some have asked, and especially one prominent minister who was formerly a very lead minister in this church, couldn't God protect his people right in their own homes, right in this evil world, and not have to cause them to flee to a place of safety? This afternoon, brethren, we're going to take a quick whirlwind tour through various scriptures, and I'm going to show you, number one, that there will be a great tribulation. Number two, I'm going to show you that God's word declares that his church will escape before the great tribulation. That is, that many in God's church will escape. But I'm going to show you that the Bible shows some people are not going to escape. Some people, even in the church of God, and the Bible shows that Satan is going to go out and martyr them and pick them off, one by one, one after the other. It's like the Jews who saw the handwriting on the wall in Germany and Austria before World War II. Some of them fled, fearing the worst, and others stayed behind. And once the curtain fell, it was too late. And about six million Jews perished in just about that many years of war in Europe. We're going to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says on this subject. Okay? Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Now, here in Matthew 24, Jesus Christ says that we were to preach the gospel into all the world for a witness and to all nations. And then, he said, the end would come. Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, the end of this age, as he had said previously. Brethren, do you realize, and by the way, if later on you get the new Envoy, the college yearbook, that will be uh, made available here at the feast, I think tomorrow evening or uh, tomorrow sometime, anyway... One article in the Envoy shows 
this year, this work, the Worldwide Church of God has sent out, or, and will send out by the end of the year, about 50 million books, booklets, articles, magazines, correspondence courses, and so forth. 50 million. There's no impact by any church or work on the face of the earth. In fact, this is the most mighty, the most powerful work that has ever existed on the face of the earth since the days that God put Adam and Eve on this earth. Not because we are so great, or we are of anything of ourselves, but because God has opened up the means in rapid transportation and worldwide instantaneous communication, God has made it possible for us to reach vast audiences. As Mr. Armstrong, I believe, has already reached, and this work has reached well over a hundred million people. Christ and the apostles and all the prophets of old never reached anywhere near that many people. As this work has reached with the gospel of the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ's second coming. Now Christ talks about the abomination of desolation to be set up in, in Palestine, verse 15. I can't go into that, but Daniel 11, the latter part, shows that this European power, the king of the north and the great false prophet in, in, in an unholy alliance, they're going to move their capital right down to Jerusalem, Palestine. It says, in the area called Mount Zion, between the, the dead and the Mediterranean Sea, in the glorious holy mountain. But Jesus Christ, in describing these days, says in verse 20, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now this was a prayer that the disciples were to offer before they fled. I guess it was in about 69 A.D. when, the, when according to history, the disciples fled Jerusalem. But that was only an end time. That is, that was only an early forerunner of the end time prophecy that is fulfillment of this prophecy when God's people worldwide are undoubtedly going to flee the big cities, flee target areas that God has pre-marked or marked out beforehand are going to be cities that God will allow as Sodom and Gomorrah of old to go up in flames. So according to this, Christ didn't tell his disciples to sit tight. He said, pray that your t the time when you flee, your flight, would not be in the winter, that would be very difficult to flee when it was cold, or it says neither, neither on the Sabbath day, and of course that's a rest day and you couldn't rest if you had to flee. Notice verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, that is great trouble, great pain and agony and suffering, great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And Christ says it's going to be so terrible that except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh, not one human being, would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the church's sake, the chosen one's sake, the word elect means the ones who have been chosen and who have been called out of the world. For the sake of God's church, then, those days shall be shortened. But not only that. The church is going to flee. That is probably the majority in the church, and some are going to refuse to flee. Some are going to say, well, look what happened with Jim Jones and some of his people when they fled. And Satan has already, already prepared the way for the doubting Thomases, for the skeptics, and for the lukewarm people, so that when the time comes, that they're going to be afraid of what their friends and relatives and others will say when God's church is told the time has come to flee. Now when will we flee? To what place will we flee? How will we be taken to such a place? And exactly who's going to go to that place? I hope to answer as many of these questions as possible this afternoon. But first, before we go back to it, some Old Testament scriptures to, see you, uh, to show you some parallels. Let me read from a fairly recent article written by a former minister, a high-ranking minister, in which he had written an article entitled, You and the Great Escape. Now, this minister is well known as one who ridiculed God's apostle 
even when he was a member in the church and he ridiculed God's servant in various, so far as various teachings of this church. And this minister did not believe when he was a minister among us and even openly taught against the church fleeing or escaping. And I've heard him and others have heard him. Even uh, most of the ministers in this room have heard him ridicule the idea. And it's not an idea, it is a fact that God says his church is going to escape before the great tribulation falls like a trap on an unsuspecting world. Okay, let me read a little bit. This person says, he wrote in this article, if we're obedient to Jesus Christ's commands, he says, we're just as secure even if we are living in a home surrounded by incredible plagues and troubles as were those Israelites on that awesome and turbulent night so long ago. He means Israelites in Egypt. Well, what this minister didn't say here, though, that is misleading is that the Israelites in ancient Egypt were in the land of Goshen. They lived in a land apart from the rest of the Egypt from the Egyptians. The land of Goshen was where they settled. And God plagued the land of Egypt, except the land of Goshen where the Israelites were living in a separate land. They were not living in the land inhabited by the Egyptians. So that is not a correct parallel. This person goes on to say he, do, he doesn't believe that, that the Israelites stayed in their homes that night as they were commanded, like Mr. Armstrong has always taught us. He says in the wee hours... We morning hours following that incredible scene, that is, the destruction of the firstborn, the most massive escape in the history of the world took place. Somewhere between three and five million men, women, and children left the land of Egypt that night. Well, that's not true. They didn't leave the Egypt that night. They left Egypt the following night. It says on the morrow after the Passover, it says that they left Egypt on the 15th, not the 14th, the night on which they took the Passover, and it says they went out of Egypt by night. And God had told the Israelites, when you put this blood on the doorposts and on the level overhead, he said, let none of you go out of his house until the morning. And they stayed in their homes that night after they took the Passover. And then the next day they got their belongings together and they all came together at what is now Cairo. They came from the far corners of the land of Goshen and they congregated on the daylight part of the 14th at what is ra called in the Bible Ramses, and they departed from Ramses on the following night, not the same night. That's just a another little detail. This former evangelist of the Worldwide Church of God got mixed up c trying to uh, contradict Mr. Herbert Armstrong. But now let me read you an one final statement before we get into the Bible, what he says. The death angel that will stalk this land during the Great Tribulation, and that part is true, there will be a death angel given power to stalk this land. In fact, the whole world. That's what the Bible says. He says, the death angel that will stalk this land during the Great Tribulation will see very clearly the blood of Jesus Christ that is sprinkled on your heart. He will pass over your house just as surely as the death angel passed over the Israelites so many centuries ago. Well, remember, the death angel passed over the whole land of Goshen. And the plagues didn't fall on the land of Goshen, a separate land, a land apart from where the Egyptians were living. So in that sense, it's not a true type of uh, people staying in the world and just being in your house in the middle of New York City or Los Angeles or Houston or St. Louis or Kansas City when those cities go up in atomic blast. This minister concludes by this section by saying... God is able to protect you right where you are, end quote. Now, I don't think anybody, brethren, would argue with that point, that God is able to protect you right where you are. But that's not the point. In the Bible, if we accept the Bible as the Word of God, in this book right here, the Bible shows that a great tribulation is coming and God Almighty commands us to flee before the great tribulation falls on this world, before the, the uh, black thunderclouds burst forth upon all nations. And there will be horrible wars. It will make World War II seem like a picnic. We don't know precisely when it will come, but it will come. It's just a matter of when. 
I want to show you then, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to go through this very quickly. In Genesis chapter 6, it says the earth was very corrupt. Verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God said in verse 7, I will destroy man. But he found Noah was a righteous man. And in the 11th verse, the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. The nations are arming to the teeth today. There's violence in many parts of the world. Homosexuality, marital infidelity, lying, cheating, drunkenness, drug addiction, you name it. The whole world is becoming one gigantic Sodom and Gomorrah. And, the, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And so God said that he was going to destroy it, and he did. But before God destroyed the earth, God sent his prophet Noah. God told Noah what was going to happen, and Noah went out preaching to the world, and for a hundred and twenty long years, Noah told the world, God will destroy this earth. While Noah had hired undoubtedly a number of men to help him and his sons and others to build a big ark, undoubtedly out in the middle of a desert someplace or out in the middle of, on a piece of dry land, people became, they walked by, they jeered. And of course, when the rains began to come, after Noah and his family had gone into the ark, they were taken into their place of safety, which was an ark. And through the waters that destroyed the earth, they were lifted up above the civilization and they were saved while the whole world perished. They were taken out of the world in an unusual manner. But a closer parallel to what is going to happen in our time, the closest parallel I know of in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. I'll just have to go through it ever so quickly. In the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, that we find here were two angels, actually three, two angels in the Lord that appeared to Abraham, Abraham entreated them. Two of the angels, that is the two angels, went on toward Sodom and Gomorrah, where the Lord said, go down, see what's happening there, and deliver Lot and his wife and family. And then we read here in verse 17 of Genesis 18, and the Lord said, that is, unto Abraham. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? That is, that, that thing which I'm going to do. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Then notice, he said in verse 20, he told Abraham, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, they were sinning horribly. God said, therefore, I will go down now. I myself personally, I, the great God, the Lord, the ruler of the universe, I will go down and see, that is, for myself, whether they, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, he says, I will know. And then you remember how Abraham, when God told him this, he was worried about his kith and kin, Lot and his family. He said, well, Lord, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he finally got down to saying, Lord, if there are only ten, would you save the city? And God said, yes, if there were only ten righteous people in this city, I would save it. Well, you know what happened. There weren't ten. So in Genesis 19, these two angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot entertained them. And it says here, verse 4, Before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, they surrounded the house, both young and old. That is, young and the old men, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into you this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now this was just no casual greeting they had in mind. The Moffat translation words it very plainly. 
Because in the Bible terminology, in the King James language, the truth is often hid by the obscure words used. In Genesis, I think it's chapter 4, about verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. It's a way, it's a word that means in, in that sense to have sexual knowledge or carnal knowledge of. And so when these men said that we may know, we men may know these two men who came to visit you, what they said is, we're sex perverts, we're going to come and rape these men. And so the Moffat translation says, bring them out to us that we may rape them. And you know that America is filled with homosexuals? Some say it's one in six, I don't know what the exact number is, but I know there are a lot of male homosexuals, a lot of female homosexuals. I'm sure some of you, unfortunately, have been mixed up in that type of thing and have, have repented of it and have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But one in six, I think, the last I heard. Much of San Francisco, a, a great large number of people living in the San Francisco area are known to be homosexuals and have a great deal of political clout and have to be pandered to by the politicians if they want to get in office because it's known that so many homosexuals live in, in San Francisco. Recently, America has received many of the sweepings of, of Castro's prisons, and many of them are known to be homosexuals and all sorts of criminals. And so America is getting the sweepings of, the, of Castro's or, or Cuba's prisons and a, a lot, another influx of homosexuals to further degrade and corrupt this nation. And God is going to allow it because our sins have reached into heaven. And God said, enough. God said, too much. I won't let it go on forever. And God, in his word, prophesies that our people are going to suffer as few have ever suffered. Now let's notice, though, in Genesis 19, what happened. Now, finally... In verse 12, the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here besides son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whatsoever you have in the city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Eternal. And the Lord has sent, it, sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out, he spoke unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters. He said unto them, Up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy the city. But they, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They paid no attention. They just jeered. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters, which are here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while Lot lingered, he hesitated, he fumbled around, he said, well, let me get, you know, go back and get my socks or my toothbrush or whatever he had. He was lingering, let me take a few things with me. And the angels were looking at him, Lot, come on, we don't have much time. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought him forth abroad, that he said, the angel that is speaking to Lot said, Escape! Escape for your life! Look not behind you, neither stay in, in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Well, I won't read it. This word escape is used in three or four more places. Here, you read the rest of it. Lot and his family were told to escape! The city before it was destroyed. That's the way God saved Lot and his family. Not in the city, but by taking them out of the target area before the Holocaust was to strike Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, we read in verse 23, The sun was risen upon the earth when the Lot entered into Zoar. Zoar was a little village some, some distance from Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. I think in the coming escape, when God's church escapes, I think there are going to be some carnal people that will go along with us. 
whose hearts are not right, and they're going to be looking back figuratively and spiritually, and God is going to see that they drop by the wayside. Any who look back, just like Lot's wife, look back. Her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah, wicked as though they were. So Abram got up in the morning, and verse 28, he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Here was a great smoke, a great pillar of smoke, like an atomic bomb, and the mushroom cloud going up over and a, a city that's been blasted. That's what Abraham saw. But God took Lot out of that city beforehand. And brethren, the Bible shows that in the days to come, God is going to take his people out of the areas, the target areas that God is going to destroy before the Holocaust comes. Let's go over to Luke 21. Now Christ had prophesied certain things, and he says, now we don't know, we don't know exactly what the sign will be. Quite frankly, brethren, we don't know when we are going to escape. Will it be six months from now, a year from now, three years from now? We don't yet know when. To be perfectly frank, we don't yet know the place to which we will escape. And furthermore, we don't yet know exactly how we're going to get there. But brethren, we don't need to know those things yet. God will reveal those things when the time comes. If we are right in his sight, if we are just, God will make it clear. He led Lot and, and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah just briefly before he destroyed those cities. Now Christ says in Luke 21, verse 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Now, brethren, this prophecy had a twofold or a dual fulfillment, like nearly all prophecy, has an early fulfillment and a latter fulfillment. The Roman armies came down in the area of Jerusalem, if my history is correct, in about 66 A.D. The Roman armies then, in, in 69 A.D., withdrew. You can look this up in, in various histories. The Roman armies, the, the, the Roman legions, had tightened their grip around Jerusalem in the middle and late 60s. But in 69 A.D., for some reason, the Roman armies withdrew from Jerusalem. And the Christians who believed Christ, they knew this was a sign that they had better head for the hills. And they got out of there. History says... Uh, Gibbons, Rome, and decline and fall of the Roman Empire says they went to a little city northeast of Jerusalem on the east side of the Jordan River, a little city called Pella. That's what history says. And they escaped. But according to other sources, some of the, many who had heard Christ's words didn't heed, and the Jews didn't heed, and Josephus says that their blood was slain on the temple steps and ran like water down the steps of the, of the very temple, the house of God. And hundreds of thousands, at least scores of thousands, were butchered. And many scores of thousands were led away captives into all nations. But that was merely a type of what Daniel 11 shows is going to happen when the armies of this beast power move down into Egypt and take over Egypt and take over the Suez Canal and take over parts of the land of Israel. And it says that they're going to set their capital in Jerusalem, in that area. And that's probably the very time when this is going to happen. When you will see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Jerusalem is a burdensome stone, as Zechariah 12, I guess it is, shows. The nations have all got involved with it. God says all those nations that get involved with Jerusalem will be cut to pieces. And I think there were about 14 nations that moved their embassies into Jerusalem recently. And when the Arabs threatened them, they said, if you don't move your embassies out of Jerusalem, we'll cut your oil off. And all the nations, I think without exception, moved their capitals, their embassies rather, right out of Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv. Jerusalem is a focal point. It's like a, a, a firecracker waiting, or like, more like a bomb, a time bomb, waiting to go off. When you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies or surrounded by armies, 
then know that the desolation thereof is near. Notice what Christ said, verse 21. Then let those that be in Judea just pray, the Lord can protect you right in your home. Nothing is too great for God. Is that what he said? Read it again. My glasses, I guess, need changing. Then Christ said, let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's what it says. They were to flee. They were to escape to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it, that is, of Judea, depart out. And let not them which are in the countries enter thereunto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And woe, now that word woe means misery and grief and trouble. Woe unto them that are with child to those that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. The very wrath of Satan the devil upon this people and of various other nations. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And you can go to Jerusalem, as many of us have, and the Gentile Arabs are still right there, controlling the mosque, the Dome of the Rock, and that whole area. The temple site and many other strategic areas, they are still in control of it. They're still there treading it down. And the Jews haven't dared to chase them out of there. Because this prophecy has yet got to be fulfilled. They're going to remain there undoubtedly until Jesus Christ returns. But notice what he said in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing. Notice that. Having heart attacks. Failing them for fear. Out of stark terror. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then. After this great tribulation period. Then. Shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds. Cloud with power and great glory. And he says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. And he says, in other words, the kingdom of God is just about to be established. But before the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes in the clouds of heaven, on a white horse, with millions of angels following him as his warriors, according to Zechariah 14, before that burst of divine glory appears on the scene, there's going to be the most traumatic, horrible events take place on this earth that, the, that will ever occur in the history of the wor world. Men fainting for fear. That's exactly what the Bible says. Now, before we go back just to a few more scriptures very quickly, I want you to next to... I just want to show you the state of the arms industry, I want to show you just a little bit of how the world is arming itself to the teeth. Three times in recent months, a countdown toward nuclear devastation has begun in the Air Force's dimly lit combat operations center deep beneath the Rocky Mountains. I'm reading from U.S. News and World Report of June the 23rd, this, this year. On each occasion, a computer reported that Russian missiles had been fired at America, placing U.S. bomber and missile crews on instant alert. Jet engines roared, and navigators plotted courses toward pre-selected targets in the Soviet Union. We were getting ready to blast the Soviet Union with our hydrogen and, and, and um, uh, nuclear weapons, and we could blast Moscow and all the Russian cities off of the face of the earth. And they can do the same thing with us, except they've now got more nuclear might than we have. It happened. In fact, for years, people have referred to the atomic stalemate or the nuclear stalemate of massive weapons that America and Russia have. They've referred to this doctrine. It's known as MAD, M-A-D, for Mutual Assured Destruction. They can destroy us, we can destroy them. And I think it's rightly named because indeed it would be MAD for anyone to start war. And... 
to have to live through the consequences. Here's an article in Time of August 25th showing our Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, with entitled Rethinking the Unthinkable. The unthinkable is that a nuclear war could, could develop on this earth. Brethren, do you know how much we're spending in our military today? We're spending, I believe the latest budget goes up to about $150 billion. The United States is spending to build more horrible weapons, indescribable weapons. And they say Russia for years has been spending far more than we have, even though she earns a lot less and her wealth is much less than ours, she's spending a far bigger percentage of her income, of her GNP, gross national product, on military weapons. And by 1985, it's estimated that the U.S. will be spending $225 billion for arms to destroy super weapons, that type of thing. In fact, I've got an article, I don't have time to read it, showing the horrible thing the horrible types of new weapons, death rays, laser weapons. And just to describe one of these weapons here, I'll read one paragraph. In theory, at least, lasers. And there, there are other weapons that they mention here, the x-ray weapons they call them, that are even worse than lasers. But in theory, at least, lasers could destroy enemy missiles with beams that travel, that is, beams of light that travel at or near the speed of light. You know how fast that is? You know how fast light travels? That fast, unless, light would travel around the earth seven and one half times in one second. It says that these beams, these laser weapons, instead of shooting a bullet, they just send forth this light, these pulse, pulsations of energy or of light that will destroy something. In the time it takes an aircraft flying at twice the speed of sound, what is that, 740 miles per second or 640, I forget. But anyway, at about, say, 1,500 miles per hour, an aircraft flying that fast, it says, um, sound, uh, let's see, in the time it takes an aircraft flying at twice the speed of sound to move slightly more than an eighth of an inch, just that far, a laser travels a mile. Whoever gets into space first with operational lasers will obtain strategic superiority there and perhaps everywhere, literally, in a flash. In other words, if you could put your sights on a, on a, uh, a weapon that you couldn't even see over the horizon, anything at least that you could put within your sights of your, of your weapon, that they could destroy it within a flash, just like that, that this, this, this laser beam would go out in just a split second, would destroy anything. Then I've got an article here regarding stealth aircraft. These aircraft that are invisible, to show you what we're developing. Then an, um, uh, America has, brethren, already developed, and could have it operational, undoubtedly, most any time if we really wanted to speed up. We de developed the horrible cruise missiles. Now the cruise missiles, they say, are so deadly that we could take a, a, a football field in Moscow or Leningrad or one of the Russian cities and that we can hit the bullseye with, with our missiles, with our cruise missiles that will go in under the radar system. Apparently, they're, they're undetectable by any known, known uh, defense system. There's, and, and they have a guidance system that can go around mountains or, or and up over it, hugs the ground, and that we could hit, they say, even a football field in Moscow or in any city in Russia. And they say, by fine-tuning them, you can, you can make them so accurate, you'd not only hit a football field, which would be perhaps a little less of the size, I mean, a little bigger than this thing, but you can make it go between the goalposts. And we, we think these are marvelous weapons. Now, the Russians have already exploded a bomb, they think, in the, in the range of 50 megatons. That is, 50 million tons of TNT, the equivalent. You know how big that is? No, you don't. I don't either. The mind boggles. T try to comprehend it. Now, we dropped these blockbusters on Germany in World War II. And we would destroy a block. And we thought, wow, the super bomb. Then America came out in, at the end of World War II with the A-bomb, Fat Man, that we dropped on Hiroshima. And we destroyed, in a flash, 80,000 people in the whole city. With a tiny little bomb 
that today is a firecracker in comparison with the huge hydrogen bombs. Now, a hydrogen bomb of 50 million tons is, well, just look at this. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were only 20 kilotons, that is 20,000 tons. That's the size of them. The equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT being exploded. That was the size of the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now they've got one, not 20,000, but 50 million tons of TNT. And you can't imagine what was, that would happen. If it drop over here near the lake, well, you know, all the way up to Eldon and down to, I guess, halfway to Springfield and the fallout and all the rest, you wouldn't have anything left. It would knock out New York, Moscow, Los Angeles, any city, and for miles around, and there wouldn't be any life survive, except maybe a few rats deep down in some holes in the bowels of the earth. I must not take any more time to show you some of these nuclear weapons. I've got a chart here, though, that shows how many nations now have bombs, and now it's Brazil, Argentina, Israel, Canada, South America, West Germany, and Sweden they believe also have bombs as well as the U.S., USSR, Britain, France, China, and India. And they say they believe that the following nations now are working on the bomb. Pakistan, Iraq, who's now fighting against Iran. Iraq, Libya, Egypt, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. We are arming, that is, the nations are arming to the teeth, to the hilt, and they're going to use these weapons. And that is the kind of an age in which we live in an age of super weapons. And now I think you can begin to understand a little bit why Christ says to watch and pray always that we might be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass. Brethren, I won't have the time to turn back to Ezekiel 5 and read this, but I'm just going to tell you what's in this chapter. It talks about, in verse, I guess it's verse 12, anyway, in Ezekiel chapter 5, in one of the verses there, pardon me, no, it's in verse 4, It mentions that all Israel is included. And brethren, we intend to come out pretty soon with some research to show that we have proof that the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples migrated from the southern shores of the Caspian Sea and the books in the British Museum and the histories that I searched out when I was in England prove this and we can show you how they migrated across through South Russia and Northern Europe over a period of centuries. As As the prophecies had said, that they would be scattered and sifted through the nations. We are, our nations, the Anglo-Saxon Celtic descended nations are the part of the peoples of modern Israel. God says our people are going to be destroyed, our nations, because of our sins. Ezekiel 5, he shows that one third will die of pestilence and of famine. He said a third will die by war, by the sword, and he says the remaining third will be scattered into the winds into all nations. Figure 225 million people in America today. You take one-third of those left, and that'll show you what you've got left. That's the same time spoken of in Matthew 24, a time of trouble such as never was, never shall be. It's the same time spoken of in Jeremiah 30, time of Jacob's trouble. And if you'll read Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah asked the question, he says, Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, holding his stomach like a woman giving birth to a child? And he says, All faces are turned to paleness. It's the same time that we read of in Luke 21 when men are having heart attacks, their hearts failing them for fear. It's exactly the same time. Isaiah 47 also shows the destruction of Israel. And it shows the Catholic Church, the woman there, The daughter of Babylon will be the religious power that will ride the beast. It will be working in cahoots with the military power in Europe. In Daniel 12, verse 1, it says there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to this same time, nor ever shall be. Same time. Daniel 12, verse 1. God says he will also send Michael, the archangel, finally to deliver his people. In Ezekiel chapter 14, let's just go through this very quickly. Ezekiel 14, verse 13, Son of man, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, I've got some statistics I'd like to show you, but time doesn't permit, to show you how many people are living, I think, is it two and a half million living in wedlock? I mean, out of wedlock here in this nation? To show you the horrible statistics of this land that each year 
of the nation's 10.3 million young women, 15 to 19, that is ages 15 to 19, it says half of them have had premarital sex. It says that very, very few are virgins by the time they're marriageable age. It says one million teenage girls out of every ten get pregnant each year. In 1977, it says statistics, a study even then showed that 600,000 unwed teenagers were giving birth each year, and they're a lot unreported too. And these, it says, the sharpest increase were under 14 years of age. The venereal disease, it says, is rampant among adolescents, accounting for 25% of one million reported gonorrhea cases every year. Just gonorrhea alone, not to mention syphilis and the other venereal diseases. This is an article, if you want to read the article, Newsweek, September the 1st, 1980. This same month, an article in Newsweek. I've got a lot of other shocking statistics. Our nation is sick. One in four will get cancer. That means about 1,500 of you here, according to the law of averages, will get cancer sometime in your life. And a far greater number will be claimed by heart attacks because of the horrible foods and the poisons and the sprays. The air we breathe is polluted. The water we breathe is pollu- or that we eat is polluted. And crime is rampant in our cities. And immorality is everywhere. That's the kind of an age we're living in. Son of man, this is Ezekiel 14, verse 13. When the Lamb sins against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it, and I will break the staff of bread thereof, and I will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast upon it. And God says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. And then in verse 20, it's, it's, this is repeated three times, I believe, here. And in verse 20, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the eternal God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. God had a purpose for delivering. Lot's daughters, he had a purpose for delivering. Noah's sons, because God was going to preserve posterity, I'm trying to say, on the earth. But this time God says, if your sons and daughters, and undoubtedly putting all the scriptures together, it means if they're age, at that age that they're mature enough to be accountable, they're not going to be taken to a place of safety and escape with you just because you're righteous. Now, obviously, young children are not included in that. If you put all the scriptures together, I don't have the time to prove this. What is the age of accountability in the Bible? Twenty was the age that God held people accountable. Read Numbers. And when the Israelites grumbled and complained, all who were 20 years old and upwards, God said, will die in that desert because he accounted them as being accountable. The men in Israel went into the army, were inducted into the army at the age of 20. The Levites began serving, carrying the, and doing out the physical tasks in the tabernacle at the age of 20. And sometimes we consider 18 or 19 or 21, but 20 is the age the Bible speaks of. So undoubtedly those who, who are in their late teens or are certainly in their 20s, if they know the truth and aren't living it, they're not going to be spared because we as parents are righteous. Now then, we'll have to hurry in close, closing. I just want to give you very quickly just a little bit more showing you clearly that the Bible shows we are going to escape before the Great Tribulation. Notice here in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and let's go quickly. It says, speaking of the Laodicean church, uh, pardon me, I meant to say of the Philadelphian church. Verse 10, because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation. Now, if you look in the marginal reference, it says the hour of trial, or the hour of tribulation, when we're going to have trial and tribulation. Because we have kept God's word. We obey God. We keep His holy days, His Sabbaths. We tithe. We, we obey God. Not perfectly. We all fall short. And the righteous will scarcely be saved. But we obey God and therefore God promises to protect us. Now let me show you where the prophecy clearly reveals this. If you'll turn over to Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 12. Mr. Armstrong recently, in fact, even in the, in the message to us the first evening, referred to this, and he said he believed that this has happened 
that it looks like it happened perhaps beginning in early 79 when the, the most powerful state in the Union with an $18 billion budget came down upon the Church of God to try to crush us. I'm going to show you a sequence of events here that you never realize perhaps the same way. It talks in Revelation 12 of the woman. Ephesians 5, Revelation 19, other scriptures clearly show the woman is the true church of God. In verse 7, coming down into the end of this age, it says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and, and they prevail not, it says. And neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Mr. Armstrong said this is to be fulfilled in the end time as it happened before Adam and Eve were put on this earth, at the time when the, dis the whole universe, or, or much of it, went through a, a period of destruction when Satan battled against God. So notice, the first thing there's to be, was to be a war in heaven. Secondly, the devil would be cast back to this earth, he and his angels. Then what would happen? Well, I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God. So this happens right at the time. It doesn't mean the kingdom of God is here. It means it is just on the threshold, just around the corner. Now is come the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. They over, over, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. The devil is angry because he knows that this work is preparing the way before Jesus Christ as John the Baptist and his disciples prepared the way before his first coming. This is the Elijah-like work, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, teaching people to get back to the laws and statutes that Moses gave Israel. And the devil was angry, knowing that he had but a short time. Now notice, so... That says, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth. So first, there was war in heaven. Secondly, the devil was cast back to the earth. Then what happened? When the devil saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. We believe that may have begun in January 1979. That that was fulfillment. Apparently, this scripture seems to be a fulfillment of this phase of it. But that's not all. He began persecuting the woman, the church. Then what happened? Now this may be a few more months, it may be a few more years. So he was going to persecute the woman. Then the, the next step, step number four, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Now the Moffat translation says that she might flee and, or escape into the desert. It used the word desert into her place where she is nourished, or that is, is to be nourished, for three and a half years. Time, times and a half a time is definitely three and a half years. I don't have time to prove it. But I think even other churches understand it that way. So the, so the fourth point is, after the devil has already persecuted the church, which he is now doing, and has sought to destroy the church, then God causes the woman to flee, to escape, to a place of safety. Yes, to the woman were given two wings that she might fly or escape or flee into the desert. Now, brethren, is it, rather, is it not rather significant that God caused Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong to flee out of Pasadena in, 1960, in 1977, if I recall correctly, just, just about a year and a, about two years before this struck? And I know I've been in his home many times in Tucson, Arizona. He lives in the desert. He's got cactus trees in his backyard. He lives in the desert there in Arizona. Now, I don't mean we're going to flee to Tucson. I don't know where, what desert. There are many deserts on the earth. But God caused Mr. Armstrong to go there, and many people wondered why. I don't know that Mr. Armstrong fully understood why. 
And then when the Attorney General with $18 billion behind him came in and pounced on this little church and called us a bowl of spiders and said he expected us just to cave in and he re- didn't realize that he didn't have a bowl of spiders. He had a, a, a cage of tigers by the tail. And now the question is how to let go. We believe that this may well be the beginning of this verse that says the devil persecuted the woman. And that the next step in God's church, so far as any great thing prophesied, is that God's church is going to flee. When? We don't know. Exactly. Yet. Where? We don't know. Exactly. Yet. Neither the disciples know when they were going to flee. Until 69 AD when the Roman armies withdrew. Then they fled. And they had to flee hurriedly. And now the devil inspired Jim Jones and even in the worldly magazines they say he was demon possessed. Even other religions believe he was possessed. He was so wild, throw his Bible down and say you don't have to go for that book. And he led, as you know, hundreds of people into Guyana. And then in his demoniacal uh, teaching told them they should take poison and drink poison, which they did. Yet I don't believe a one of you would take poison if God's ministers told you to. Because that's against the command of Almighty God. And you're taught to love the commands of God. And you're taught to obey the command. But yet, the devil did that so that when the time comes that God's church flees, there are going to be people saying, Ah, ha, 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 there you go again. Jim Jones all over. And he's going to make it more difficult. And it's going to take guts and courage when the time comes and we have to pick up and flee. It really is. So then the church flees and will be protected for three and a half years, it says, from the face of the serpent, where he can't get to us. Do you ever have a, a snake scary, I mean, staring you in the face? Or do you ever stay, stare at the face of a snake? And I, I might quit it. Oh, I have. Copperheads, rattlesnakes. I kill them. I love killing snakes. I really do. As a boy on the farm, more than once, I helped kill a rattlesnake or copperheads. I was once fishing around in a stream and I got a hold of this thing. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a fish. And I found I had a, a, a cotton mouth or some kind of a snake. They're deadly. And I was trying to dislodge it until my brother told me to get away. Well, we're going to be protected from the face of the serpent. And like a deadly cobra standing up there, you know, we're going to be out of the way of its striking distance. And the serpent. Now what's going to happen? What's the next point after God causes us to flee to a place of escape? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now what does that mean? Very simple. If you let the Bible explain its own symbols, I don't have time to read. Read Jeremiah 46 verses 1 through 8. And there the Egyptian army came up, as it says, against Israel as a flood. And in Revelation chapter 17 it says that the whore, the false churches, sits on many, it says on, on many waters, which it says represent peoples. So waters represent peoples, and when you get waters on the rampage like a flood, that's people inducted in the army that are going out to destroy like a river that's flowing out of its banks. And so this represents undoubtedly an army that Satan is going to command. We don't know what nation it'll be, or United Nations of some kind, I don't know. But all we know is that he's going to send out an army into the desert, wherever God's people are, to destroy them. That he might cause the woman to be carried away or destroyed by the flood. Then what will happen? And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Maybe an earthquake, maybe a, a, a great storm of some kind. But the elements of nature that God controls is just going to cause this this army to be destroyed, like Pharaoh's army was destroyed. You remember the Red Sea? And then what will happen? The church is still secure out here in the desert. The devil had sent out an army to destroy them. They were destroyed. The devil's frustrated. He realizes he he can't destroy the bride, the church. And then he is really angry. And the dragon was wrong that is angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Those, now that he couldn't, he couldn't get to those in the desert, they're out there, they're secure, he knows he can't strike them, he tried. Now he goes back to get those to pick them off one by one, scattered throughout the rest of the world, people that were lukewarm or in some way didn't escape and didn't heed. And so now the devil went to make war with those who yet remain. 
within, you know, his striking distance of him in the world. Those who didn't flee, and he goes to make war with the remainder of the true Christians, of the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Brethren, the Bible clearly here in Revelation 12 and other places shows, and I guess I'll just have time to read one more scripture. These are by no means all of the scriptures. But let me read one more scripture in the Old Testament that says the same thing. I dare say most of you had never even noticed it. This is back in, in um, Isaiah chapter 26. Verse 20. And it prophesies exactly the same thing that we read of in Isaiah, or rather in Revelation 12. Just couched in different language. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Come, my people, God says. Who are God's people? It's his church. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Here it calls it a chambers, or it says over there, the desert, into a place where you'll be protected. And shut your doors about you, like a storm is about to come, and you shut all your doors and windows. You batten down, you get ready, so the storm can't get at you. Enter into your chambers. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, three and a half years, just a split second in, in eternity. A little moment, until the wrath, the indignation, be overpassed. Whose wrath is it? Satan's wrath. In the great tribulation, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity because of their sins. The Sodom-like, Corinthian-like licentiousness in America today that we export around the world. Our pornography, our playboys, our rotten TV entertainment programs of our lust and violence that we export to all nations and a lot of other filth instead of showing the nations God's way. And God is angry, he says. For God comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain because the saints are to be resurrected at that moment when Christ returns and the saints are to rule with Christ with a rod of iron. And God will, re will reward the saints who have been slain and resurrect them and they're going to be the governors ruling all nations for a thousand years. Brethren, these and other scriptures show clearly that God Almighty is going to cause His church to escape the target area, in this case, our vast, vulgar cesspools that we call cities, with our slums and our filth and our pornography and all of our rottenness and our decay, scabs, blotches, in the eyes of God. And God is going to cause those people who sigh and cry, as we heard this morning in the sermon, for all the sins and the abominations, those people who do fear God, those people who obey God, those people who believe God. And just as he caused Lot and his family to escape the target area before the Holocaust struck, and just as he told Christ in the New Testament, told the Christians to flee Jerusalem before that city was destroyed and leveled to the ground. Likewise, God says we are to flee, we're to escape before this. And don't you ever let anybody else tell you otherwise. It's not a matter of whether God can protect you or right in the midst of some cesspool. He could protect you if an atomic bomb blasted off over your head five inches. But that's not the way he did it, and that's not the way he's going to do it this time, and that's not what prophecy says, that God is going to cause us to enter into our chamber. He's going to cause us to go into the desert someplace. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know where. But God will open up the way as surely as he opened up the escape from Egypt through the Red Sea and as surely as he opened up and caused the Roman legions to withdraw from Jerusalem 69 AD and caused the Christians to escape. Likewise, brethren, when the time comes, God Almighty is going to tell us where to go and when to go and how to get there. Don't you worry about that. So if you forget everything else, that I have said in the sermon, I want you to remember 
that Christ told us to pray for two things. You remember what they were? I'll read it again. In closing, the final, final scripture, Luke 21, beginning 34 through 36. Christ says to the Christians, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with gluttony, with excessive eating and drunkenness, excessive drinking, drinking, and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Look, notice this. What day? The great tribulation, as he's explained previously. Notice verse 35. Will it just be on the peoples in North America or in Europe? No, for as a snare shall it, this day of tribulation, come on all them that dwell on all the face of the whole earth. Worldwide. World War Three. Horrible, unthinkable World War Three nuclear devastation that will make the horrors of World War Two seem like a picnic. And so, realizing this, Christ says, Watch you therefore and pray for two things. One, that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these horrible things that will come to pass, he said. And secondly, that you would be accounted ready to stand before Jesus Christ at his second coming. Brethren, when I started out, most of you admitted that you weren't praying daily for these two things. And Jesus Christ, your Savior, commands us to watch and pray always for these two things. Will you obey him? I hope so. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.